that's my name. I'm sitting today with John McKay and Rich Mundell. Um, Nolan Kane, unfortunately, could not make it today, and we're going to be talking about uh, university research. So John and, I, John and I may actually touch base a little bit on what Nolan is doing, because um, it's important information as well. John McKay is a professor. His PhD is in plant genetics or molecular genetics, something like that. Um, uh, he's a professor at Colorado State University and also founder of New West Genetics. Over the last growing season, he was able to get some European industrial hemp varieties and planted them on two locations in separate parts of Colorado, which I have no idea how that actually went, uh, but we're about to find out. Rich Mundell is a professor at uh, University of Kentucky, and he did something very similar, I think with probably a slightly larger number of uh, varieties, and they were actually able to start in 2014. Nolan Kane is a professor at the University of Colorado. He's not a grower. He's more interested in genetics and the genome, and he has been working on sequencing various genomes, whether they be industrial hemp or marijuana, and looking at uh, things that he has found. Um, he's got a couple papers about to come out and be published, which will be very interesting when he's able to do that. So let's go ahead and get started. We'll start with John. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about the European varieties that you got, where you planted, and uh, how that went. So we um, worked with, uh, well, after um, uh, Kentucky um, went through their trials and tribulations and were able to get seed in, um, uh, in 2014, then the Colorado Department of Agriculture pursued a similar process. And uh, meanwhile, at the university, um, all of the, um, uh, the lawyers were making decisions and eventually uh, decided it was okay to, to, uh, to, to import and grow hemp under the Farm Bill. And so we started for 2015. I connected with a um, researcher in Italy who was a, a principal investigator on this EU-funded project called Multi-Hemp. And they, um, he's been working with hemp and hemp agronomy for a while, this guy Stefano Amaducci. Um, and, um, and, and then under the other people working with him on the project, we're doing some genetics, uh, some, you know, uh, phenotyping for textile phenotypes as well as, um, cannabinoid and, and oilseed phenotypes. And so, uh, we wanted to connect to a existing program because if we just got our own varieties and grew them in, you know, one or two places in Colorado, it's unclear how to interpret those data. So anyway, we... Um, but looked to import um, something around 25 varieties uh, that uh, the CDA got a permit for from the uh, DEA. Those were shipped, uh, came into Denver Airport, um, and then uh, we they ended we ended up get losing um, uh, eight of the varieties um, uh, to border control um, uh, for uh, reasons that uh, we won't go into here, because there really aren't any. Um, uh, anyway, so we ended up with a slightly different experimental design um, that was planted in uh, up by Fort Collins, and then you know Colorado's a, a, a big state uh, uh, compared to those little European countries, so we were able to actually get three degrees of latitude. Um, so we planted down the bottom uh, of Colorado in the four corners, and and uh, there we didn't have enough s seed for all of the varieties, but we, we planted them in those two locations, and um, it was you know interesting challenge to uh, you know none of the uh, field people involved had uh, grown hemp before. Um, the timing wasn't perfect because we we're held up by imports, uh, which I think <laughs> we'll hear more about that, and um, and then but anyway we we learned some. Um, you know, we we learned, we found varieties that basically don't reproduce uh, in in our latitude. Um, uh, they they uh, initiated flowering after Halloween. Uh, this year was um, uh, a very strange fall. We normally have a hard frost um, by mid September, uh, and and the farmers rely on that to kill their corn so they can harvest it uh, in a reasonable time. Uh, this year, farmers were harvesting corn uh, around Christmas or even into the new uh, year. And so uh, so the point there is that one year of data is not enough to make a decision of what variety is the best. And certainly uh, one anomalous year is even less um, worthwhile. Um, we, are, we, are, uh, we have plans in place to repeat um, 
these trials this summer. Um, we're actually updating our variety list. Our, our collaborator took um, the performance data of these varieties in the two locations and used a crop model to then try to predict um, what other varieties might actually fit here better. So they parameterized that model, mostly with field sites across Italy, which is actually rather similar in latitude to us. We're still lower than uh, we're like Sicily here. But, um, uh, but anyway, so that though we should be getting those varieties. We're, we're just waiting right now to find out um, about funding from um, the University Ag Experiment Station uh, for these varieties to go forward, for this variety trial to go forward and be repeated again in these two locations. Uh, did you do THC testing? Um, THC testing was done by the Colorado Department of Agriculture. They, yesterday they handed us printouts of the data I, Brian, my PhD student back there, I assume he stayed up all night, entered the data, and analyzed it, but I haven't seen him yet today, so I don't know. Uh, yeah. So we'll find out soon. We'll find out. Uh, yeah, we also have samples ready to test for other, uh, for cannabinoids and terpenoids, but don't have funding to, um, to run those analyses at this point. So, so we've been trying to... Um, you know, we're, we're working on a pretty lean budget uh, here. There's no federal funding available. Um, so we're, uh, lo you know, tapping into uh, the generosity of uh, any collaborators we can find. So, uh, so Rich, uh, 2014, Kentucky tried to import seeds and it did not go so well. You want to talk about that? Am I on here? Yeah. Yep. Um, <clears throat> so it was uh, interesting and, and the seed was held up. And it cost us a lot of issues uh, for our first year. Uh, we got the seed very, very late, as, as uh, everybody knows. Uh, we were under pressure to get that seed in the ground. They were some Italian varieties. Uh, we quickly put that seed in the ground, and, um, and everybody had a lot of hoopla about it, and it was, it was a lot of uh, interest in it. Um, and then we did germination test on that seed and found out the seed was horrible. Uh, Germination on most of it was around 30%. We had two that were acceptable at 80%. Uh, average on, on the rest of them was around 50. Uh, but since we didn't know that ahead of time, we were under pressure to put it in the ground. Uh, we didn't make adjustments on our seed weights as they went into our plots. And so basically our data was just crap, basically. Uh, but man, did we learn a ton from what we did in 2014. And, um, and then in hindsight, after we, we we did collect some data. We found out that we did not have the rights to share that data. Uh, more paperwork and, and, and problems with, um, with dealing with getting seed. So then we thought, okay, uh, we're ready to roll in, in 2014, we, we, uh, 2015, and we learned uh, so much in 2014. Uh, we said the seed's going to be here. We know, we know we can get it in. Um, and then we had more issues with the DEA and getting it in the country. Uh, one instance, there was a seed lot that was actually shipped to Memphis by FedEx, and uh, Memphis realized this is a control one substance, and our KDA said, hey, can we just come to Memphis, let's pick the seed up. No, we're going to ship it back to Canada. So it, none of it makes sense, but hopefully it's going to get better. But we did get our seed in, and um, we hit the ground running in 2014, and we actually had out nine experiments in the field. Uh, everything we did was completely randomized and replicated. And um, we developed a plot seeder over the winter that allowed us to do plot work, uh, both with grain uh, densities and um, fiber density and CBD work. I'd like to introduce Leah Black, who is our graduate student working in CBD. Uh, some questions earlier were asked about spacing. A lot of her work is going to involve spacing of CBD plants in the field. Uh, so hopefully next year uh, she would have some information on that. And, and Feel free to talk to her afterwards. Um, this year, we're going to hit the ground running. Uh, we're expanding all our programs. We're going to repeat everything we did last year, a large fiber trial, uh, grain variety trial, uh, fiber variety trial, dual purpose variety trial, and maybe some CBD variety trials, but that's still up in the air. How about, uh, do you have any total crop failures in 2015? We did not. We were very, very fortunate to uh, be successful in everything we planted. Uh, but there were several failures around the state. A lot of it had to do with um, weed problems, um, not getting that crop started quick enough. 
uh, to close that canopy and prevent the weeds. And of course, there are no herbicides labeled for hemp. So um, if we had some, we could have saved some of those crops, but we did have some failures. How about a THC concentration? Were you able to test that as well? Well, fortunately, in my group, the Kentucky Tobacco Research Research and Development Center, we have a very good analytical laboratory, and they now have the UN protocols, and we can do all our THC testing and CB testing in-house, which is very nice. But the KDA did come and sample all of our plots. Uh, two weeks prior to harvest, we had to give them notice, and they would come and, and they sample, and they send that off to a uh, independent lab for testing. And if we get our results back and we're over the limit, we have to destroy, destroy that crop, destroy the seed. Uh, but fortunately, we haven't had that problem yet. And were you, uh, are you bringing in seed every year, or were you able to store seed and grow again the next year? Um, fortunately, because we're university, we worked out um, a deal with the KDA that we uh, securely stored a lot of our seed that we didn't, some of the seed we didn't put in the ground last year. It came in so late, we just decided <laughs> let's hold it over. Normally, we would not be allowed to do that, but we were able to do that this year. So even if we have trouble getting seed in this year, we will be able to move forward in a timely manner. A lot of our, our, our fiber data anyway was compromised because we did not get the plants in the ground and they reached reproductive maturity at a much shorter height than normal. So our yields in fiber were much lower. This year we hope to avoid that problem. Okay. So John touched on funding a little bit. Let's talk about that. Um, because hemp is still a controlled one substance and it's illegal on the federal level, it is almost impossible, if not impossible, for university research to get federally uh, funded grants to perform research. So Nolan had a way that CU helped him develop essentially a nonprofit organization that you can go online and make a donation to Nolan Kane's studies at the University of Colorado. I know John's a little bit different. I assume Rich is a little bit different. Um, can you touch base on where you guys were able to get money from? So we, um, we got some funding from the um, Colorado Ag Experiment Station, which is, um, is basically a, a source of, of funding within the university to support agricultural research and extension. Um, and it, it uh, covered, uh, we, what we needed to do was make sure we had funding in place to pay the salaries of people um, that were conducting the research uh, so that they weren't being paid off of federal grants, which is, where we how we pay everyone else that um, does any research uh, in the lab so so that uh, yeah so that was um, we spent twenty thousand dollars last year um, actually fifteen thousand dollars last year um, we're hoping to get twenty thousand dollars this year which will all be for salary um, uh, to then cover these trials so my group is the Kentucky Tobacco Research and Development Center and we are funded independently from a tax on cigarettes sold in Kentucky so we had funding up front. Uh, we had a meeting very early in, in the process in 2014 where all the people that were interested in doing hemp research at the university got in a room and the first thing that was said is there is no money and all the heads just dropped. Uh, but since we have separate funding, we were able to put some money. We put $5,000 up to get things started. Um, and then my co-investigator uh, is David Williams. A lot of you probably know David Williams. Uh, he had some operating budget from where he came from in the turf industry. I have operating budget for my tobacco work. This fits our mission at, at our group because not only do we do conventional tobacco research, but we try to find new crops for Kentucky farmers and our tobacco is declining rapidly. We're hoping hemp can fill a lot of that uh, void. And so uh, with our two operating budgets, we're able to get started. And then a lot of our, well, all of our research, um, all of our trials are funded by uh, companies, uh, Sunstrand, funds our fiber trial. Uh, Cottle Seed funded our grain variety test um, last year. Atalo Holdings in Winchester, Kentucky uh, is into all components of hemp. They funded our dual purpose uh, variety trial. Um, Leah is funded by CV Sciences, a two-year master's program, which is very generous of them, and uh, that, that worked out really well. Uh, with our variety trials coming up this year, we've put out the word that we will uh, for a fee, like we do all the commodities at the University of Kentucky. We will test your varieties if you'd like to see how they um, do in Kentucky and how they match up to all the other varieties that, that could potentially be grown in Kentucky. Uh, we, will, we will do that and, and, and put out a report that it will be available to everybody in the country. 
Um, so we're hoping eventually that we will get um, some more funding, hopefully from the federal government. But right now, we're just um, working with collaborators and, and getting funding everywhere we can. Good. I guess this question applies to both of you guys. Um, Colorado State University of Kentucky, are they able to and is there any interest in them developing their own cultivar of industrial hemp? Um, uh, interest, I would say yes. Um, uh, at, at Colorado, uh, in general, um, you know, over the past uh, 100 uh, years, the, the proportion of, of varieties that are bred in the public sector um, has declined uh, um, in most countries and especially here. So, um, so <coughs> there's not, years ago the AR, USDA ARS and University Extension would release varieties uh, and farmers would grow them. Um, the, uh, you know, farmers kept basically demanding more and more uh, higher yielding varieties with you know, better management, and that has shifted over into the private sector. Um, and so the only breeding program, really, that we have um, uh, at the university now is for winter wheat. And, uh, and that is funded through the, the uh, sale of the grain from the farmers, and so, uh, uh, as well as through a, ch a checkoff, uh, and, and uh, that's the checkoff, and royalties on the Colorado varieties. So that they spend about a million dollars a year um, funding, you know, mostly salary again to uh, put out all of these trials and pick the best varieties and continue that breeding process. So starting a new breeding program, um, you know, uh, at the university is something that uh, no one knows how to fund. <laughs> so I would echo that. We had a company that was interested in funding some breeding work, and we have a tobacco breeder, a wheat breeder, and a soybean breeder in-house at the university. We asked all three of those, uh, and a grass breeder, if, if they would be interested in that. And um, most of those guys are late in their careers, and they just didn't, even though they were initially excited about it, after thinking about it, there's already too much on their plate. And, and they just said, well, thanks for the offer, but no thanks. Funding, right? So here's, here's another option of funding that doesn't work for these guys. Um, I know a lot of marijuana businesses that are interested in the idea of kicking money back to help fund hemp research. So it's possible to acquire marijuana money and give it to Colorado State so Colorado State can fund John's trials. However, technically under the way the law is written, that can be considered money laundering. So Colorado State is absolutely going to be against acquiring that type of money. or we at least think they will. Maybe in a year or two down the line, they might change their views. But just another step of regulations that's very difficult for the industry to progress forward, at least on the, the research and development level at uh, university levels. Um, a lot of info. And it looks like Artie actually has a question. I'll let you go ahead and ask. Most certainly, um, when it comes to the industrial, oh, can private entities uh, partner or contract with Colorado State to help fund research? Colorado State actually has a program that allows that to happen for anything that somebody wants to study. So if I have an idea, like an engineering idea, but I don't have the capability of building that out, I can go to CU or Colorado State and say, here's the money that I have to fund this. See if you can find a professor in this area that would want to take this on, and then we can partner and do it that way. Um, the Industrial Hemp Research Foundation is trying to do that. They have a, a partnership with Colorado State right now, but also they're having problems finding money. So they would love to fund John and uh, couple of projects at University of Colorado, but again, they're not getting much money. The money's in marijuana right now, and marijuana wants to help, but can't, and other people in marijuana don't want to help, and really are adamant against it. There's actually a provision in Amendment 64 that mandates the state legislature can distribute t up to $10 million to the CDA, so the CDA can fund a research grant program. 
if the state was to actually do that, then CU and CSU and private farmers would have access to the marijuana tax cash fund because that's where it's supposed to come from. And we could move forward with marijuana money. Um, there's a lot of other issues with that as well, so I won't touch into that. But I will open it up to questions for a little while, um, and we can go from there. Yes, sir. I'm not sure that it was all related to planting scheduling. A lot of it, I think, was related to just not understanding a, uh, how the to question, plant it. Sorry, Rich. The question was um, the crop failures that he saw, was it because of the late planting? I, so some of that is probably uh, true. I think a lot of it was that we just didn't know how to plant it. A lot of farmers probably planted too deep. They planted at a time when available moisture was not readily there. And so the seed just sat there in the ground, and the weeds did not, and the weeds got ahead of it. Uh, in our case, we, we saw that we planted fairly shallow. We had good seed soil compaction with a compaction wheel after the drill. Uh, we saw germination within a few days. Um, in one particular test, five days after we planted, we could see visible rows from 100 yards away. So I think it's key to have moisture available, uh, not plant too deep, and, and get the get the crop up and get a canopy closed as quick as possible. And I think a lot of it was just um, poor emergence, slow emergence, and the weeds just got ahead of it. And we have no no way to to help with herbicides to uh, to try to try to save the crop. How deep did you plant? Uh, all of ours was planted at a quarter inch. We just recently finished conducting two runs of a greenhouse study to look at seeding depth. Um, and we noticed that hemp germinates very, very quickly, uh, but it does not have a lot of push-out power. Seedling vigor is a problem. Uh, getting out of the ground, once it's out of the ground, it jumps once it gets some photosynthesis going. Um, so we haven't analyzed that data, but anecdotally just collecting the data, it looks like uh, there is definitely an advantage of keeping that seed closer to the surface of the soil and waiting on moisture. Uh, plant when you know the moisture's there. Don't plant and think the moisture's coming because the weeds are not gonna wait. Um, I actually want to add a comment to that. Um, I did the same thing with some feral stuff that I found, and I got up to four inches deep. I would still get germination from the seeds. So definitely genetics makes a huge difference, and as you're isolating and breeding to homozygosity, then you'll get certain things that happen where a quarter inch, because, I mean, look, we're looking at basically very small seeds. Um, some get much larger as you're doing your isolations, but the small seed and you want to have them closer to the surface. I would say too, just as a side note, that tillage and conventional tillage, we would recommend a finer tilth and a level uh, seed bed, uh, much more than you would uh, till for corn or beans or even wheat. Uh, no, we didn't look at uh, land races. That um, that would be a fascinating thing to do. Um, they're probably going to be, you know, not domesticated, um, but they would have some adaptation to, to different climates. We're only able to take certified varieties um, in now from that have passed the THC test in, in Europe and been certified as that. So uh, we could, however, if someone wants to extract DNA from all of that stuff, uh, accept DNA from uh, any germplasm and start to uh, look at, ha at the relationships there, which is, I think, something, we'll, we'll tr uh, something we've been trying to do and something Nolan's been working a lot on as well. Because, um, uh, you know, that part, um, you know, basically the more samples across the species range, the better to ask those types of questions. Yeah, actually, I'll jump on that. Nolan has been finding some very interesting information. Um, so THC synthase is the gene that makes THC. It makes a protein, and that protein converts CBG or CBC to THC. And what Nolan has been looking at when he's doing his whole genome screens, he's looking for the THC synthase gene and is finding gene duplication events. Uh, we know that from a, a professor named George Weeblin at the University of Minnesota, also published a paper this last year where he looked at just two varieties, one uh, industrial hemp and one marijuana, and found that there were some, were some gene duplication events. What Nolan is finding is 
how do you really increase THC? How do you get THC in marijuana from what we had back in the 60s, you know, the six, seven, eight percent up to the 33 percent that Gorilla Glue uh, tested out at the Cannabis Cup in California? And what he's finding is that you're getting gene duplication events up to 20 genes. So there's 20 THC synthase genes in some of these marijuana varieties. So it's very interesting to see, too, how that will affect uh, breeding over time. We know that cannabis is state unstable, hemp is unstable in general, and you have to continuously rogue your plants for THC because THC concentration will go up regardless, and this may be one of the reasons why, as the plant is feeling stressed and it's not making enough of its secondary metabolites, one of the easiest way to increase that is just double your gene copy number, and now you have twice as much of your THC. Um, any more questions? Yes, sir. You talked about uh, if you save your seed and replant it, the THC goes up. Um, how do you prevent that? And what is roguing? You mentioned oh, roguing. This question is for me? Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, no, that's fine. Uh, let's go to the roguing question. So when you're, uh, when you're in the... You're... To develop a proper cultivar, when you look at phenotype, so if you're selecting via phenotype, you rogue. So you plant whatever your number of plants. Let's say we have 25,000 plants in our two acres of our field. Every day you go out there and look at your field and you want to positively select for the plants that you're looking for. So as an example, my roguing technique this year for my fiber plant will be June 1st, I'm going to select a, a height of a plant. And any plant that's lower than that height, gone. July 1st, select again. Any plant that's lower than that, gone. So I'm positively selecting for the plants that are growing tallest and fastest. If they have branches, I don't want branches. So those are gone. And then when it starts flowering, I'm going to look at the strongest males, the males that have the strongest fiber content, and get rid of all of the other males. Ideally, what you want to get down to is one or two males that are breeding with females that are like one another. And so you just continue to replicate that. I was talking to somebody who is a dog breeder today, and I said, what we'd ideally like to do is do like we do with dogs, where you get something that you like, and then you backbreed to its father, and then you backbreed that to the grandfather. Um, and that helps to create this homozygosity in your plants. Um, did that answer the roguing question? Yes. What was the second question, the first question? Uh, if you save your seed and replant it, the THC gets higher and higher. How do you prevent that? Great question. Um, by continuously positively selecting for chemotype. So that it, it's really interesting how to see how some of the breeders were doing. Um, when I went to John, thank you very much, introduced me to the European Industrial Hemp Association, and I went to their conference in 2014, and I was really worried that I was going to be so far behind all of these plant breeders, and it turns out all the European breeders weren't doing a ton of this genetics work. Um, but so one possible way is you have to know your THC synthase sequence and your gene copy number. And every couple of generations, you want to continuously to check that in your plants so that you know you still only have two copies of this one THC synthase gene and it's going to relate to this amount of uh, THC in the plant. Um, you also want to make sure you stay away from hybridization. I talked yesterday about how hybridization can increase THC concentration. So you want to be positively selecting for ideally the genetics, but in the end you always have to check for a chemotype. And when you start seeing that THC go up, you go back to your founder line or your original set of germ genetics or germplasm and start over again. Actually, John might be a great answer to that question as well. Do you want to add on to that at all? <laughs> um, yeah, I think, uh, I mean, it, if, you, if you grow um, you know, a variety that doesn't uh, uh, make THC, uh, there are you know, genotypes that don't do that. Um, it's not going to magically start making uh, THC um, in, in you know, subsequent generations unless it gets pollinated, unless it receives working versions of those genes from something else. Some of the hemp varieties, some of the European hemp varieties are bred as populations. Uh, a lot of them are. And so they're, they, when they select, they're selecting the frequency of THC synthase down, but it's not to zero. And so then if, it's, if it increases by chance, 
um, uh, then you, you've gone over. And that's happened, like in Canada, that happened to Finola. But if you actually look at the sequence uh, and variation in Finola, which is published in that genome paper from John Page, it has THC synthase in it. Uh, and uh, I think it has a couple of copies of it, uh, some that are functional and some that aren't. So it's, yeah, it can be perfectly predicted. And you, you can find a bag of seed that no matter what you do to it, won't make too much THC. Um, great point, John. There's a variety of industrial hemp in Europe that is certified 0% THC, but it has the marijuana version of the THC synthase gene. And the way that this happened is it has a mutated version of CBG. So it does not make CBG. Because it doesn't make CBG, it cannot make THC, regardless of the fact that it has the marijuana gene. Now you talk about THC going up. Cross that once with an industrial hemp variety that has CBG synthase, and now you just made marijuana. Yes, sir. Hi. I have two questions. The first is, uh, is it possible to stop the, uh, the, the THC synthase from creating uh, THC in plants? Like, uh, similar to what you said. And the other is, um, besides breeding programs that were mentioned, um, what are the major topics that the research institutes are researching and what are the questions, uh, the major questions want to, wanted to be answered by the research? You want to take that one? Um, I'll take the second part of that. Okay. Well, the, uh, so, yeah, so there's a lot of... Um, uh, Interest, um, you know, at the university, people are it's generally filled with curious people uh, that aren't, you know, uh, uh, in law enforcement, so they're not that concerned about um, the difference between uh, hemp and marijuana, and you know, uh, and realize that hemp can just be considered as a crop. Uh, um, so there's a lot of interest. I mean, there's, you know, I'm I'm a geneticist, so that's the part that interests me. But there's people in um, you know, working in textiles, there's, you know, people working in agronomy and variety trials, and really what, um, you know, so I think there's plenty of, of curiosity and, and um, uh, expertise to apply. Um, you know, a lot of these questions, um, you know, you basically just copy what you would do for any other crop uh, and, and, and get the data that we were lacking for hemp, right? So when do you plant, what density, all of that stuff. So, um, and there's actually people in, in ag economics that have developed proposals to study the market um, uh, and the value chain for, for the Colorado agricultural industry. So really, it's just, um, but you know, we I received zero dollars. I, I get nine months of salary from the university, uh, and if I want to, um, you know, uh, measure a plant, I have to buy a meter stick and pay someone to go measure the plant. So. So we, you know, it all requires funding and just to get, you know, not to harp on that, but uh, that's, you know, it's not like there's not people that don't want to do stuff and have the interest. They just, you know, can't uh, spend time doing something that, uh, and getting everyone in their group to do it as a volunteer. We actually have gotten more undergrads to volunteer uh, to weigh hemp biomass than, um, for example, our canola research. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> Yeah, D and DNA sequencing, you know, is uh, uh, unlike agronomy. DNA sequencing has gotten easy over the past uh, 25 years. Uh, uh, there's these massive high throughput machines. Um, they exist all over the place. So we're, um, you know, and and we're allowed. We've been just recently allowed um, uh, to handle cannabis derived DNA. Um, uh, uh, it's well known you can't get high off of DNA. Um, <laughs> However, uh, the DEA was, um, has been regulating um, nucleic acids, uh, but um, that uh, now we're okay with that. But, what, but George Weiblin, who was mentioned, did all of his research under a Schedule One DEA permit, and basically every time he wanted to plant an experiment, he had, they had to come look, and it was, it's, it's, it's not really amenable to, uh, he, you know, it's, it's, you can ask him about it, but it's an interesting story trying to do research under that. Uh, arbitrary level of regulation. So, how about you, Rich? Is there anybody else at University of Kentucky? Um, <clears throat> we actually ensiled some hemp this year. 
uh, and it went through the, the process and, and made pretty good silage as far as the, uh, the way it smelled. We had it analyzed and the, uh, the relative feed value was right up uh, equivalent with very good alfalfa. So that kind of spiked the interest of some forage people and also some of the animal science people who would like to see if this is uh, something that could benefit uh, the cattle industry, uh, the dairy industry. Uh, it's still a problem because it is a Schedule One. Uh, they're reluctant to feed it to animals right now because you may not be able to sell your product. Um, but that was uh, pretty much a surprise to me to have a feed value that high. But a lot of people are thinking outside the box at the universities all over Kentucky. Uh, most of our state universities are involved in some level of hemp research and even some of the small colleges are, are wanting to get involved uh, just to educate mainly. Um, animal uh, ag engineering is working on uh, equipment to harvest uh, hemp, uh, modified combines to help uh, deal with the fiber, uh, producing machines that'll harvest buds for CBD uh, and all those guys are being funded by private processors uh, that have, have come to Kentucky to take a chance on the industry actually happening in Kentucky. Um. Um, it's, it's, we're totally anecdotal. We have uh, our mini silos are made of PVC and we put about uh, 12, uh, about seven pounds of hemp in the silo and, and of the four silos that we opened, uh, the average was 150 RFV. Um, we didn't ask, we didn't answer your first question. Uh, are there ways that you can stop THC synthase from making THC? Right, so you have DNA is transcribed to RNA. RNA is translated into a protein, and a protein has a function. So you can, in theory, stop any one of those three steps, and you wouldn't be able to produce THC. They're rather complicated, and in most cases, very expensive. So it's not something that, I, John actually mentioned this today, that probably anybody is really working on. I have four different ideas to eliminate THC, and all of them would cost a lot of money. So I myself am not doing any of them either at this point in time. And uh, that's actually 110, so we got to get going, but thank you very much. <laughs>